How's it going? Well, uh, I'm usually not on this side of the camera. I'm usually on the other side. So this is yeah. different for me to be on critics. Well, we decided that Do you're we even need Phil anymore? No, or? man, you're a way better <laughs> critic than he is anyway. So Although I got a feeling we might agree a little too much. I don't but know. But we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. All right, well, let's roll this clip because it's going to be kind of interesting. Hi. Hi. What are we doing here? Well, you should know. You invited me. I kind of want us to review these clips on the internet. And I couldn't have done it from home, just on a webcam. I had to come all the way here. Yeah. Hmm. How poignant. How poignant. <laughs> that was exactly nine years ago that we did our first episode. So I think we might actually have him on a webcam. Really? Do we? <laughs> Phil? Hello. Hello. Bam. There we go. You asked no. and I put you on the webcam. No expense spared there, Steve. I mean, <laughs> no, we, we saved some expense there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you used to you used to fly me over to Chicago. Now I you know. just say you got Skype. Uh -huh. Yeah, but you're such a fucking pussy that we used to have to pay business class because you won't fly coach, and it, the, the show just got too damn expensive. I'm not a pussy. This is a pussy. Uh huh. Oh, hi, so Percy. Ah. I want to. Uh, <laughs> We have an unexpected surprise today in that uh, we have two guests that actually came down to Zacuto to... Our first live studio audience. <laughs> I know. When we said live, they thought, oh, there's a studio audience. So you know what? You guys are welcome. Come poke your nose in here so people can yeah. see you. We weren't really yeah. ready for this, so we don't have a camera for them. But Adam and Chris. But at least they're here, so but, we might uh, refer to you guys in a, in a little bit. So Yeah. Um, so, you know, I want to just uh, bring up a couple things, and then we're going to get right into it. You know... Uh, p over time, uh, we did a lot of episodes of this show, and people have said, you know, what gives us the right to give critical advice, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know our background. They know Phil's a bit more, but you and I are coming up on our close to 900th program we've made a show, videos, yeah. co commercial, corporate, uh, web series, now live shows. Most people know us as manufacturers, but no, we come from that background. And we're also good, you know, com uh, what do you call it, consumers of this stuff. Because we love movies, we love all that kind of thing. So we watch a lot of material. Right, but in your whole life, did you ever imagine that you'd be manufacturing products? People think that's our no, life. No, we were, We were working, man. We were doing production. That's all we ever did. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, Phil. I know everybody knows a little bit about your background, but why don't you just give them a little quick uh, tour? Of my house or my, my life? <laughs> <laughs> of your life. In case they don't know who you, you are. Know, what gives you the right to give critical advice? Uh, I have no right to be giving anybody critical advice because I hate getting critical advice myself. But I watch a lot of stuff. Uh, I judge a lot of film competitions, and I am a filmmaker. I've been in the industry for 29 years, and uh, you know, I I make a lot of stuff. I've made a lot of TV in my time, and I've worked on a lot of documentaries. So I think you know, I, my opinion's as good as anybody's, and uh, it's certainly a better opinion than yours. So oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> here, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So today, I think it's really poignant that we decided that we were going to go after each other's work on the first episode. It's a good way to sort of reboot the series, you know. Um, yeah. Since we critique others, sometimes you guys are pretty harsh. Let's let's do it to each other. Okay. So today, should, should we recast it at least for the reboots? You know, got somebody younger than Steve. You know. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. nice. Hey, you, well, you, to be fair, Steve, you were practically. Um, my age when we my age now when we first did it so I was exactly your fact. age when we first did it you're nine years just yeah. so everybody knows you're not you're not you're nine years younger than I am really yeah yeah so I was exactly yeah, his then. age I never would have known but I still had ten <laughs> times the experience but let's Ooh. forget about that so now uh, <laughs> let's talk about these two films Phil's film is called pole dancer and ours is called Cole soul and Phil, just give us a little log line synopsis about your film. Yeah, I'll give you a clue what it's about. The title, there you go. Um, it is a film, a short documentary, about 10 minutes that I made uh, as part of my um, cinematic masterclass, which I spent six months working on last year, which is a training course, online training course to teach you everything. And in the penultimate episode, I focus on the story 
and I tried to find a documentary subject that could take all the disciplines that I taught in the previous episodes and I put it into and then, and then I tried to find a story and I talked about the process of finding something that was interesting and I could really just put those disciplines into and when it comes to the subject um, I didn't know much unlike you Steve I didn't know much about pole dancers <laughs> and what it was I I assumed uh, had the preconception like most people of what it's about and when I looked more into it I found it quite interesting and really that's as much as you need to know and I'm a big believer in you should never need to read anything about a film before you watch it if you have to give um, information for people to understand or you know get some background then you've not done your job as a filmmaker hmm. yeah I would agree I mean I like to go to movies sometimes where I know nothing I say going cold <coughs> I'm like don't tell me anything I go to plays that way too mm -hmm. um, I, I remember going <coughs> to a play and and uh, saying you know what is this thing about and you know somebody said well it, it's in the damn title <laughs> you know but anyways uh, Let's talk about our thing just quickly, because I think you can give a log line. I think that's fair. And mm. Cole Soul yeah. is really about a man who, well, at one time was a boy, who had a dream of being a singer-songwriter, and then he had a kid. And then he had to do the responsible thing, and he got a job at the Board of Trade. And at a certain point in his life, he had to decide if he wanted to give up his comfy job and go after his dream. Mm -hmm. So let's play a clip from Pole Dancer and we'll have a conversation. I was really worried that I was going to walk into a room full of really tall, skinny, blonde women with big boobs and gorgeous. And there were those there and they were beautiful inside and out. I was only 15 and I remember going to some shops and buying some pink trousers and pink shorts because I thought that's what everyone would be wearing. But there were so many different types of people there. It was, it was really nice and accepting. I first discovered pole dancing when I was 15. I remember my mum seeing an advert in the local paper saying there were pole dancing classes for fitness nearby. Uh, my dad said, you're not doing that, you're not doing that. And I said, oh, you can't stop me, it's a fitness class. So I went along, did it for fun and fitness, and it was brilliant. Pole dancing still, um, still has now, but definitely back then, had connotations that it was all to do with strippers and that if it was to do with strippers, that means it would be a bad thing. So I think my dad was looking out for me, being 15, that maybe it might have been a bit too much of a sexual thing to get involved with at such a young age. Okay, nice. uh, I think we should run a clip of Cole Soul and then we go right at it. Sure. Okay. Rational people won't make that leap to do what I did. To turn over a comfortable lifestyle, to be an artist, to follow what you do, you've got to be a little fucked up. I have lied where the truth should reign from my home my family I have turned away in shame to be the man I have sold my soul for the carnival ride of women in wine what have I become to make a leap you've got to have some faith you got to have some faith in God or some sort of higher power that if you're following the truth that something good might happen. I've never been much on praying. Just wish somebody would bring the rain. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to get right at it. Phil? Um, Hello. I think, so we both made stories about an individual. But mm -hmm. I think that just because there's somebody that, you know, some people say, oh, I have a, everyone has a story to tell. I don't think that's true at all. I think that you, you're, 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 I don't think that I really understood the story 
of your piece. It was like, I'm a pole dancer, I do it for exercise, and I don't know anything about your life, I, didn't, I don't know what your angsts are, I, to help me here. It's a film about a woman who explains what, why she does pole dancing, what she gets out of it, talks about the preconceptions of it, and to try to dispel some of the, the you know, those preconceptions. And you get to know her, so you get to know her passion. You don't get to know everything about her, and nor would I expect to in something which is about what, you know, what she loves. Uh, and, I, and I think it, it ticks the boxes for that. You know, you can, you could go more in depth if you wanted to and try to get, you know, try to find more about her as a person, other things that she does. But I think that's a distraction for what I was after here, which was really just um, to learn something about something I, don't, I didn't know anything about. And I said, had those preconceptions. So Phil, of course, your stuff looks gorgeous. You know, it looks beautiful as always. Um, but I felt myself kind of um, wanting to know a little bit more about her, the rest of her life to kind of understand how this fit in context. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of a light story there, but I wasn't like, you know, I kind of wanted to know more. That's you know bullshit. I mean? There was no fucking story. <laughs> all right, I'm it's trying like, to be easy. I, I know I'm not going to be easy yeah, right. because he's a storyteller and that's bullshit. Right. That the sto okay. I had cancer. I overcame cancer through pole but dancing. But that probably doesn't exist in her case. Well, then she doesn't have a fucking story. Okay, that's the okay? kind of the point, I not guess. Not everything has a story. Yeah. Unless no, you I, want to I know about pole dancing. completely, as always. Yeah, whatever. <clears throat> you get to know about that. Not everything has to be about somebody overcoming an incredible disease or hardship to get where they are. Bullshit. It's... it's it's all right. So if you want to do, a, you know, the subgenre of cancer sufferers, then that's fine. But for me, it's <laughs> it's. I think it's nice that actually, I think you learn something about this and you're educated, which I think is one of the most important things. When I put out a lot of things, uh, the short documentaries that I made are there to educate people about something they may not know about. So, so it's and, a and corporate also for me film. to learn about it. It's like a corporate film, a corp well, or a little not educational not even film. No, well, the educational then, doesn't have to be corporate. You can watch any film and, and learn from it. You can watch a documentary about how they make a tractor. You may not be interested in that, but you learn about it. You learn, you know, it's there. See, I wouldn't call me, that a documentary. I would call that an educational film. What's the difference between a documentary and an educational a film? A documentary film <laughs> unfolds a story as you're shooting it. So in other words, like we went into this, our film, and I'm not saying our film's great or anything, but we went in to unfold the story of this person's life. There has to be some conflict there, I feel, to, yeah. be, to make it compelling. Thank I didn't, you. I didn't feel some conflict in yours, but I guess what you're saying is that not everything needs that conflict. That's bullshit. But then it's a little harder to maybe stay with it. No. You have to have hey, conflict. Hey, Steve. What? I don't, Hi, I'm going to gonna butt in. Okay. Yeah. Hey, we hey, have some comments from the audience who are catching up a little bit here. Um, Clinton, um, Clinton Habe says everybody does have a story and it's up to the filmmaker to find it and tell it in the most compelling way. And Absolutely. then Carol, yes, in regards I, to I um, Clinton, you guys saying cool. that you maybe don't see what's happening in Bloom's film, says she does see the story here. Most people don't hear the word pole dancing and think athlete. The story is that there is another side to her sport. So do you think it's the filmmaker's job to find the back so, person's story no, and tell it? No, absolutely not. It's I a light think, story. I think you, like, for, Jens and I have been looking to tell a story, a, another one. And it's like, we're going through people and we're like, nah, eh, eh. It's like, not everybody has a great story. Every Everybody has a story, Steve. If you're a good enough uh, filmmaker, oh. interviewer, you can you can find this out. Everybody has a story, whether it's something that might is interesting to you. might not be a good you, story, though. It might not be a good story. Okay, Steve, look, you've I, got to understand, you, underst you understand clearly that like, everybody likes the same thing. You have a weird taste in certain stuff. <laughs> bullshit. You, you have a certain okay, niche, I, and that's fine. But, no, listen, you've talked a lot. Let me have a, a bloody word. Go ahead. Loud mouth. It's, it's, I think, you know, I, all you need to do is just, I mean, a really good example, I was on the plane a few days ago, and there was a, a cabin, a dude, a cabin crew fellow, I don't know what they call them, an air steward, and he was just, one of the passengers started talking to him. You wouldn't think that this guy has a story. He's just a cabin crew guy. But the guy 
it wasn't me, but the passenger started talking to him for like half an hour and I was eavesdropping. And he's got a great story. This is a guy who's, you know, come to England and wants to become a pilot and he, this is how he's starting and he's got this passion. And you uncover this from just talking to them. You may not think, you know, you go in there blind and then you can find, you know, just by conversing with somebody, they've got an interesting story. You know, if you didn't fight, if you didn't connect with the story, that's absolutely fine. And I, I as a filmmaker, I absolutely understand that my film will not connect with half my audience or more. Who I knows? agree with you that so everybody it, has a connects. story, but not everyone has a great story. And to me, and I've said this a million times, a great movie is about an extraordinary time, not an ordinary time. Now, again, this is my fucking opinion. This isn't the gospel, and you have your opinion. But I'm telling you how I felt. I want to see movies that are extraordinary. I love that. But some people just want to see an ordinary thing. Maybe. I don't know. But we pass on shit when we don't see conflict. And conflict is the basis of every single excellent scene. Or change, you know, I mean, maybe if or it's transformation. Transformation, right, yeah. No. If, without that, it's it like have, it boring. Doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be about conflict. A conflict, you know, to tell a good story, it doesn't have to be about a conflict. You know, I did, uh, when I was in South Africa a few years ago, and I talked about this in this masterclass. I talk about this when I was trying to find stories. I had days off. And I wanted to go and make a mini documentary on each day. And I'm trying to find an interesting story that interested me. And that's a good point. If it interests me, then it could interest other people. And I went down to this beach and I was asking this local guy, is there anything interesting about this town of Durban? And he went, not really, no. Because he lives there and can't see it. He can't see the wood for the trees. And so, you know, I was just looking around and then I noticed there was a woman walk up to the sea with an empty container. Uh, and she walked up and she filled it up with seawater and then walked away. And I went to him, what the fuck's she doing? And he went, oh, they collect seawater here. And I went, why? Because they drink it. And I went, why? Because I think it's good for them. I'm like, there's a fucking great story there. And that was, there was straight away, I had, it was like, I, this it fascinates me. There was no conflict there, but I wanted to find out why they drink it, what they think it does to them, and, and just understand a little bit more. I want to understand more. In Let fact, me ask I you a question. Understand. Have you seen Searching for Sugarman? Yes. That, to me, is mm -hmm. a documentary. Mm -hmm. That story. It's a feature documentary, though. That's well, different. it doesn't give matter. Me, give me, give me ninety minutes, and I'll and I'll give you something much more in depth. Well, you have. I, I, that ninety-minute piece you made about uh, the children that went missing and shit—that was great. To me, that had a ton of conflict to it, and it was wonderful, and it unfolded, and you, the way you, you presented it, I, it, it was very much like Searching for Sugarman. It was like you're watching Searching for Sugarman, and all of a sudden you're like, uh, they douse this guy in fire, and then you're like, oh, he's dead. And then they're like, oh, well, he's alive. And then you're like, oh. And then they're like, well, he's mm. uh, super famous in this one country and doesn't know it. I mean, it's an incredible story, and that's why it won an Academy Award. So, Phil, what's your threshold for making a good story, you know, for, for committing the time to making a documentary? There's got to be some threshold there. At a certain point, it's not compelling enough, right? So where do you draw that line? I know this instance w was for your master class, so this might not count, but there's got to be some threshold for you. It's got to it's interest me. And, you know, if I'm doing something in my own time, Interest um, you, post, or post. do you think interest the audience? I mean, it's no. not just for you. You're doing. I am things. no. I, it, it interests me because you've got to start with one person, and you've got to start with you. Because if it doesn't interest you, then it's clearly not going to. It may well interest other people, but if you're not interested, then it's a terrible start. So you start with that litmus test. Do Agreed. you like the story? If you're interested in that, then you can maybe ask other people what they think about it. But, you know, I've, I, I spent 17 years working in news. I, I'm pretty good at knowing what's a story and what isn't a story. And, you know, most of my mini docs, I've done personal ones, you know, they're like a few hours worth of filming. The pole dance was done over two days purely because I was being filmed and had to talk through everything, but it could easily have been done in a day. So, I mean, but it, obviously when it comes to commercial gigs, when I'm hired, then I've really got to be interested in the story to commit, even though I'm being paid, to commit time a lot of time to something and so that that's kind of it so but i think that's the best you know if, you, if you, you're looking to to make stuff to make mini documentaries for yourself you know just think about it as 
a headline. If you re- flicking through a newspaper and you see a headline and it interests you, then you're going to read it. If you're flicking through a, a newspaper and you read a headline and you go boring, you're not going to read it. Oh, so, so that's basically you're agreeing with point. me. You're saying you vet it for a good story. Okay, with the, that. No, the, the headline. The headline <laughs> guys, is what we interests have... you. The tagline. Wait, wait, We've Rachel. We've got about a 50 You know, you never introduced split. Rachel. Okay, well, h- yeah. hold on one sec. I want to roll another clip sure. of Phil's, another clip of Cole's soul, and then we'll go come back to you. Let's roll a, a clip of Phil's. So the main reason pole dancers wear a very small amount of clothing is because we actually use our body to grip. Um, we name certain parts of our body, so the elbow pit and the pocket, um, and we use all these parts of our body to actually grip on the pole. The other reason sometimes people wear tiny little pants and tiny little bras is because we're in an environment where we can and we feel safe, and I think it's good to be able to show your body off and feel confident. I think people's perceptions have broadened with pole dancing. I think not only have people become more accepting that it's a fitness and it's an art form, but I feel people in general have become more accepting. So if girls want to dance in stripper heels and they want to go down a more sensual, sexy route of pole dancing, that that's okay as well. It doesn't just have to be a fitness. It can be um, a way to boost your confidence and let your inner sexy goddess come out. More clip of Cole Soul, and these, th- and then we'll get we'll, we'll just pass it to Rachel. You know, I, I had a brother that died, and he was shot. It was a, a disaster for our family and for his kids. Wonderful guy, and the thing about my brothers is he was cool. I remember when cool meant something before money meant everything. He was cool. He wouldn't say, Brad, don't do this. You're, it's too risky. He'd say, go for it, and that helps, right? And, you know, you never get over that stuff. When something like that happens, it becomes part of you. And I didn't really know what to do with it for a long time. And finally that phrase, killing your brother, just got got to me. You got your finger on the trigger. And if you stop to think about who you're killing, think that you'll be better in the end. You're sweating and you're scared and think that taking someone's life would somehow justify the means of someone's end. But no, did you think this might be someone's brother? Maybe someone's kid or someone's mother. Hey. Okay, Rachel? Hi, yeah, we've ha- been having about a 50 50 split almost, maybe leaning a little more Bloom's direction in the comments Naturally, of what people are saying. Of course. <laughs> a personal favorite of mine, if you will <clears throat> allow me, is Clinton Haby, who says there's an audience for every story, and Steve doesn't always have to be in the audience, which is Ooh. probably true. <laughs> but nice. we've got some good ones too. Everybody has a story, most of them aren't, weren't tell- aren't worth telling. Uh, everybody has a story. Will it probably be compelling? No. Uh, Fairly Arrow says, who gets to decide for the masses what's ordinary compared to what's extraordinary? Not everybody sees things the same way. Um, But a specific thing that I wanted to bring up was what Ron Kilby said. Um, The story needs a character we care about, either positively or negatively, and an arc. Otherwise, who cares? And then this must be in regards to Bloom. Maybe, Bloom, you can talk to this. Is Why the drone shot? Does that help tell the story, or is it just cool? Hmm. Technique. I agree with that. Very simple reason. There's a very simple reason why the drone shot's in there. Um, and I explained at the beginning, it was made for my masterclass. And each episode is a discipline. And the previous episode was about drone filmmaking. So I was looking for something that I could 
wedge in all of these different things. Whether you need these different things, absolutely not. And they definitely can um, distract and get in the way of you actually filming. They added uh, some production value for sure. Uh, would I have used them all if I was not doing it for the masterclass? Absolutely not. Um, but I, I think that there's a, a couple of shots later on in the film, which actually I think are beautiful. Um, and they're the top down, the bird's eye views of the long shadow of her. So the, it's like the actual shadow itself is in the pole dancing and, and it looks beautiful. And so I'm always after great aesthetics to complement the story. I don't always get them. And sometimes they're obviously the most important thing is the story. And you should never let the gear get in the way of you trying to tell the story you know because it can it's if you're spending time setting something up and missing something that's happening then then you shouldn't be doing it i would and I, this I'm was all shot one man band. hold on i'm going to defend your drone shot I, I liked it and i'll tell you why i liked it there there okay so when you're when you're making a documentary there is obviously going to be vo okay and myself i like the vo to always show what the person's talking about i hate this is just me. I hate when I'm just seeing some random B-roll that doesn't relate to the story. So like in our piece, he's in the cemetery. He's talking about his brother being killed. When he's, he's uh, walking, you, you feel his emotion as he's like walking away. In Phil's case, he has this beautiful shot of her dancing, uh, which is what she's talking about. So that's what you should be it's, seeing. Right. It's, it's, the, it's the reveal. It's the, it's the first time she literally talks about the pole dancing and it's you see her um and it's a, you know don't expect to see it initially and i like if he's doing a drone shot i'm a big fan of the reveal because it's otherwise if you just go you know if you already see what you're coming up to then it's quite boring but it's for me it's yeah i said it's a very i'm very happy with it i'm glad i used it i you know talking about overusing a types of things i was initially and i did film using a, a three axis gimbal in it and it was so gratuitous, I couldn't put it in the edit. I just felt this is ridiculous, and I'm not using it. So even at that point, I just went, "This is too much." Right. I, but I, I, you know, I, I think you can justify it definitely in this piece. Yeah, I mean, um, it, to your credit, it, nothing uh, of these high tech things you use distracted from it, which is really an art in itself. You know what I mean? Uh, you used it. You used it great. Um, but you don't always need the high tech stuff. Like in ours, we 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 just had to use what was on hand. The the, the most high tech thing I used was was a little jib, I think. So uh, you you know even with that, you can create emotion and things like that. And so, zoom lenses, like that one yeah. scene where we see him playing the guitar in the first clip. You had a little bit of track and and a boom arm, a jib arm, mm -hmm. and you're kind of holding the camera and zooming. I can't believe I'm describing what you're doing, but and you're zooming in. And that's a very old school way. I, we were just looking at a picture yesterday of Phil, and he was doing the exact same thing. Oh yeah, you, you had a, some jib shots. Sometimes the low tech stuff is great, and you can create just as much emotion with it. You know, the key the key thing with all of these different things you put in there, whether it's drones or jibs or anything like that, it's it's using them to you know without overusing them. So in a ten minute piece, I have I think six drone shots. A lot of people would be tempted to just fill it with drone mm -hmm. shots. Sure. And it, the power is in using it, using these things sparingly. You know, mm -hmm. for me, the, the the initial drone shot is a replacement in a way for almost like a techno crane, which you you know I would have not have the budget or crew to operate. And it did that. It just it was that. So I think that's what you always need to think about when using these tools is making sure you use them sparingly because the lovely visuals can become repetitive, and you don't want that. I agree with you. I mean, we had this conversation I think nine years ago where. All of a sudden, we got the 5D, and we had this like crazy ass shallow depth of field, and everybody is making stuff that's so shallow that it, it's not necessary. As a matter of fact, we didn't really use uh, large sensor cameras until a couple years ago. As a matter of fact, that Cole Soul might be the first time we ever used a um, a Super 35 chip because when we're doing docu's and we do interviews with people. We don't want them even remotely dipping in and out of no. focus. The, the golden rule is if the cinematography starts to take attention away from the story, you're not doing your job. Right. And, and uh, so anyways, uh, Rachel, you, you had some questions you said. Yeah. Um, Kenneth Arco has got a question um, about establishing shots. In a world of shorter attention spans and shorter videos, mm -hmm. is an establishing shot useful or needed anymore? 
Mm. I'd say yes. If the story demands it, it yes. depends. It depends on your subject. Yeah, you're right. Too. You're right. I shouldn't have said yeah. yes. It's it, it exactly. really depends. No, yeah. Sometimes starting yeah. super close is just as cool. Actually, to to critique our show, I actually when we I rewatched it after all this time. I thought it was a really slow-paced show that people are not accustomed to anymore, and I wonder how that would play to the audience. You know what I mean? People are used to a much quicker kind of. Uh, yeah, it's probably not a it's good web show. It's even much slower than than Phil's, and Phil's yours was pretty slow because of your kind of revealing shots. And, and he's all that. fucking British. All that stuff's <laughs> slow, <laughs> right? So you know, I don't know slow how that would play. Slow is good, Steve. Hey, I dude, nobody is a bigger slow. consumer of the BBC than me. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you not live here then? I know. Why I wonder because your country? weather sucks and you're there. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. I, wow. I don't, actually, I'm very rarely here, and the weather may <coughs> we may suck sometimes, but we're so close to great weather and, and culture. Do you know what culture is, Steve? Yeah. Well, you do have this one thing. You have a natural silk, and that is kind of helps you with your lack of lighting. Ooh. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, guys. All right. I have a question about music. Um, Dale Bag uh, Baglow says, "When the singer, and this is about Cole Saul, okay. <clears throat> when the singer was talking about his brother, that section was crying for some soft, reflective piano to drive the emotional nail in further." Good so point. I see Steve, you had Brad's music. Did you only use Brad's music? Yes, and I love that he said that because. Uh, the, what I've tried to do is, you know, Brad has a huge catalog of music, and I tried to start from the beginning of the show, uh, show the, the story, and use his music to tell the story of his life. And I totally appreciate his critique there, but I felt at that moment where he was standing in the cemetery, there is a long ass pause, mm -hmm. you know. That's and unusual in itself. And I just wanted people to take a gulp when somebody says their brother shot and he's standing at the tombstone. I wanted that gulp. You know, if it were any other story where it, uh, the person didn't have their own music for this, uh, he's right. You, you probably should have had or would yeah. have done something like that with that kind of, you know, music oh, totally. you're talking about. You know me, man. If there is a moment, I don't like pieces without music. Mm -hmm. But I just felt that moment should be silent. But, dude, I totally take your criticism on that. And it may have been better or it may not have been better with some warm no. music. No, no, leave. No, I hate that. <laughs> I, I, I think it's I think the emotion is in his voice and what he's saying. I don't think you need admit, um, an, an additional emotional manipulation through music or through slow zooms or any of that stuff. The OK, well, Phil knows what he's talking words, about, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another sh uh, set of clips? Uh, no, we have no more clips. <laughs> Um, but we can take, are there any other questions? Um, I think Phil maybe could talk about some of the music that you picked for yours. And like the first shot, it was sort of quite, you were quite sympathetic to her. And then in the second shot, it was getting a little more salacious, if I can use that word. What? In mm. the shots around uh, the pole. Well, how did you pick the music? Yeah. So the initial music, well, um, so I was lucky enough to, for the mask off sponsored by me by music bed. So I, I could just pick anything I wanted more or less. And which of course is fu is actually great, but also took a long time. Mus trying to find music is very, very difficult, but works for you. But I wanted it to be a reveal through the beginning. So it's gentle music to drag you in. And a lot of people would be the tempted in a, in a, a documentary called the pole dancer to hit you hard with pole dancing shots and sexy music and that's completely not what i wanted and so when we had that change of pace once we established um who she is and what this is about and we we hit the studio and we hit the pole dancing we hit um the stylized lighting and the dancey sort of music then it's it's it mirrors the music mirrors the images we're in a initially we're in a, a sort of lovely country garden the music is complementing the visuals and that's kind of what I want. I want them to, to, to meld beautifully together, not, not jar. I agree. I thought your music, the music choices were perfect. She, w it, yeah, you, you, when, you, when, when there was a sexy part of the story, you had a sexy music. When not, I mean, I mean, people, my editors know that I'm a very literal type of person and the music needs to riff everything, the titles, the music, every single mm -hmm. thing needs to boil back to your story. Um, it and just needs to foster it and push the story forward. I mean, that's why even in our it. credits, I wanted that little bit of his guitar in there because it was the part of the theme. Mm -hmm. That's his life. That's what he's about, you know. So 
Uh, I think that uh, I want to toss this back to Rachel. I know you've got some comments, and um, uh, I think that this was a great show. I really enjoyed it. It was good seeing you, Phil. Yeah, no, it's 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 nice to see you, and actually, I kind of prefer having this separation from us, <laughs> from you. It means I don't have to hang out with you afterwards. I, I don't have to keep you guys off. apart anymore. Yeah, exactly, which, which exactly. <laughs> so nice. I mean, you, you, you're great, Steve, but only in small doses, and I think 35 minutes is like a perfect amount of Steve Weiss. Okay, terrific. Wow. <laughs> I'm joking. I miss you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Rachel, what do you got to say? Yeah, I actually have one last quick little question. Um, Steve said, uh, sorry, Phil produced his film for his master class. Um, Steve, why did you make your film about Brad Cole? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, well, Brad's a friend of mine. And it started off kind of where I was like, just, you know, for years <laughs> I've said, hey, Brad, I, I really like that song, Killing Your Brother. I want to make a little music yeah, video. Music of that. video right. So we went out to um, Gary, Indiana, where they have all these bombed out. It looks like post-apocalyptic buildings there. And you can just go in and, and film. It's amazing. It's like mm -hmm. the greatest location of all time. So we went out there and we shot in one building. And then we're like, you know what? We're out here. Let's do a couple more songs. So we shot a couple more songs just, you know, really quickly. And then we came back and we're like, you know what, let's do an interview. Why not put some of this down? And it just sort of came out of nowhere. It didn't really, and we kind of had felt like we wanted to do a project. And we were like, and I was wondering if this was a good story. Well, that's just it. It, it ended up being quite a story. Once we learned, I mean, I didn't know him like you did. Right. But once I learned about him, it's like that was a story that you know, was worthy of being told. Yeah, but we had taken a little hiatus there because we just could not find a great story. Mm -hmm. And we are in search of a good story right now, you know. Mm -hmm. So, good question. I mean, I, I really liked this thing and it looked beautiful. The, my only criticism of your film, which I've not really had a chance to say, was it took a long time to get to the emotional aspect of it, which obviously was key to, to your film because it's got a lot of music and a very slow pace. And of course, you know, if somebody's watching who doesn't like the music, and I did like the music, you could lose them. And that's the my, my real thought when I was watching it, because you, you've got to keep people um, watching. And that's I think that's the only thing I was thinking as I was watching it. If you didn't like this music, you could easily not get to the, the bit which is going to connect with you on an emotional level. Yeah, Jens, you said the very same thing, so. yeah. Um, there were a couple things that I just wanted to let people know about that uh, when we shot in the church and in the city um, we actually downloaded this app called super 8 or something and we didn't want to get city permits or do any of this stuff so obviously there was some some uh, archival footage of his life and then we figured you know what we're just gonna use iPhones and go around town all the shots of him around town in the church everything were all shot with iPhones using that Super 8 app because, uh, you know, it's it. I didn't want to get permission. I didn't have time. You can't walk in with an Alexa. It's, yeah, you no. Know, it's the right tool for the right job thing again. Right. But could you not just use the DSLR? Uh, mm. You're going to walk into a cathedral with a DSLR with a guy talking? And I mean, it's just we would have had to do the, the Super 8 stuff in post then. Here it was done in camera. Yeah, it was so simple. <laughs> just like we just had a, a iPhone, and it was like, you know what? It's all, like you said, it's all about the story. So yeah. we were like, it added to the vintage flavor of having archival footage. So we were like, why not? Let's just do it. It's easy. Mm -hmm. I think it worked okay. That could be a whole other show just about techniques to move the story forward here like that. You know, I yeah. mean, that's a whole other show. B-roll, man. It's like, whatever. Talking of vintage, why have you put me in this old TV? It, it, uh, because you're old. <laughs> yeah, it fits your personality. Yeah, you're exactly. You're way older. You, mu you must be getting to 60 now, Steve. Uh, no. We got to keep no, you in a no, box, no, man. Oh, no, 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 no. 60? <laughs> no. You can't be far off it. You can't be far off it. I'm now. far. I'm very far off 60. God, that does sound horrible. Having said that, <laughs> okay. this is a good time to wrap it up. Yeah, right? let's wrap this up. So, Rachel, <laughs> what do you got for us? All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, we do have a bit of a treat. We've got a 15% off coupon for you guys. Um, it's valid on all Zakudo orders at store.zakudo.com until noon next Tuesday, June 5th. I'm going to put the details in the video description right now. So happy shopping. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye.